let me introduce, introduce the next speaker. He's uh, Rafael Bernard from uh, UFPA in Pará, Brazil. I believe he's in the campus of, of Belém now, but I might be wrong, Rafael. Yeah, yes. So you're in Belém again, okay. So uh, he's going to speak about quantum superradiance on uh, Reisner Nordstrom space, -Nordstrom space times, I believe, right? Yes. Of charged yeah. particle is in, in Reisner Nordstrom space times. Okay, so Rafael, go ahead whenever you want. So uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, what I'm going to talk about here is uh, is a work done in collaboration with Professor Elizabeth Winstanley from University of Sheffield, right? And her PhD student, Hisakan Balakumar, and is also done in collaboration with Luis Crispino from Federal University of Pará, right? So this uh, work here was where well, it started with a larger, very large project, right? And, and then after we got some good and nice results, we decided to publish a, a smaller paper, more like an, an introduction to what we are working right now. So, uh, so le let me start by motivating a little bit about this work here is, I don't think I have to talk about the importance of QFT in curved spaces because uh, you probably all heard about of the very nice talks about this in, in, in this workshop. And so I'll just say that it's a very important theory that can tell us a lot about the physical world and in, in particular about gravity and quantum field theory and the interface between them and how we can use this uh, QFT in curved space times to uh, provide insights about uh, probably uh, a bigger and more complete theory with hopefully, hopefully it's going to be quantum gravity, right? And, and the goal of this paper is to study super regions in the space time of a charged black hole. And in particular, of course, the quantum version of that. So I'm going to talk about more in details about that. And uh, to talk a bit about super regions, it's a very popular subject right now in gravitational physics. Actually, it it's a, a, a property of several kinds of systems, but we can basically understand that as a, classically as if you throw a wave into a system that has this superagents property, depending on the properties of the wave, you get back a reflected wave which has more energy than the original one. And that's basically what superagents uh, means, right? And and in particular, we want to study that in gravitational systems and, and in particular in black hole times. So the goal of the paper is to study uh, the quantum version of that. So as I said, classically, you can throw a wave in, into a black hole with a particular type of black hole, in this case, a charged black hole, a Rice and Nordstrom black hole. And then you can get a reflected bigger wave, right? Rafael? Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, because you disappeared from the participants, so we didn't know if something was going wrong. Sorry. Uh, please go on. So, but the, the audio was okay. Oh. Yes, I think now we can see you and hear you. Yeah, yeah. You can continue. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. 
Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, so this. So as I was saying, uh, you can study the spontaneous production from the fluctuations of the vacuum state, and and this is what we are trying to do. So this. And why this is important for quantum field theory is because you basically can get a, a insight about the possible vacuum states you can get and, and how to interpret, interpret them uh, based on super regions and Hawking radiation and all, the, all and other phenomena. But then you can, you can have a nice picture of the states you have and that's part of the larger work we are doing. We are trying to study the vacuum states in, in Rice and Austin black holes. So, uh, so I'll just give some details of, of the work, not all, of course, not all of them, but as I said, we, the main goal is to study the quantum version of super agents in, in a charged black hole space time. So, the, the space time, the line elements is the Rice and Austin uh, black hole, which is given by equation one in the paper, right? And, and we want to solve the, the scalar field equation in, uh, a, for a complex scalar field, massless uh, scalar field in, in this space time. So we have to solve equation four and this scalar fields coupled to the electromagnetic field of the black hole by this gauge covariant derivative. And so this is basically up, up to now, it's just simple maths, right? So you, you can decompose the modes in separate, uh, using separation of variables. And, and then the angular part is basically, it's trivial as the space times is stationary, you can uh, use uh, exponent, uh, stationary modes here. So you can have a complex exponential in time. The non-trivial part is solve the equation nine is the radio equation and you have an effective potential. And, and in this effective potential, uh, the background the electromagnetic field enters in near the, together with the wave number of the of the the modes and the non-trivial thing is that uh, far away from the horizon you you have uh, this equation basically is the equation of harmonic oscillator but near the horizon you also have uh, this equation of harmonic oscillator but now the wave number is displaced in regarding in uh, in comparison with the frequency of the wave. So instead of the effective potential behaving as minus omega squared, the, the effective potential actually, actually behaves as minus uh, omega tilde squared, which is a quantity that basically it's the frequency displaced by the value of the electromagnetic field uh, of the electromagnetic potential times charge uh, at the horizon. So R plus is the horizon. And with that, the, you can define a basis of solutions for this equation. So uh, we, we, here we choose the in uh, modes and the up modes. So the in modes are the ones that are in the past infinity, past no infinity are purely ingoing and the up modes are purely outgoing at the past horizon. So this is the, these modes are going to be important in the definition of our va vacuum state. And we can also define uh, the time reversal of these modes. So it's basically the complex conjugates at the, of the radial part and, and you get uh, the out and down mode basis, right? And these modes are going to be important to define the time reversal of, of the in vacuum state, which we will call the out vacuum state. So some did some maths, right? So you have a, you define a Klein-Gordon inner product here, and 
and you can normalize the modes using this inner product. And you can also use the Ronskian of different solutions of the, the equation nine to see how the superagents appears at the classical level. So looking at the equation 17, we can see that the, the A coefficient, which is related to the reflection reflected A, it can be larger than one when the product of omega tilde and omega is less than zero, right? So for instance, if we take omega to be, uh, to be uh, greater than zero, so omega tilde is, has to be uh, less than zero. And so you have an interval of the frequencies that you need for super agents to, to occur. So if, if when omega is between zero and a certain value is with it, it's defined by the electromagnetic, the background electromagnetic field, you get uh, this super agents phenomenon. So the, the figure one is basically just a representation of that. So we can see that reflected coefficient can be larger than one if if the frequency of the wave is uh, uh, between a certain, is inside a certain interval. And so this is basically the classical superagents, which, uh, uh, we, but we want to study the quantum superagents. So for that, we have to, so, to quantize the field. So I'm going to skip a, a, a little bit here, but the important thing is that to quantize it, we basically uh, promote the quantum, the field to an operator, right? And now there is a subtlety here because when we are used to expand the quantum field in, in the usual quantum field theory, you basically, you associate to modes with positive norm according to that inner product, that klein gordon product modes with positive norm are associated to a, an, a, a creation, uh, sorry, a annihilation operator and modes with a negative frequency are associated to a creation operator. But what we have to do here is we have to associate, it, associate a, a annihilation operator to modes with positive norm instead of positive frequency. And, and the same thing for the, for the creation operator. So you have to associate a creation operator to a mode with negative norm. So for the in modes, this is not an issue because modes with positive norm have positive frequency and vice versa. But for the up modes, uh, only modes if the omega tilde are larger than zero have positive norm. So the, the decomposition of the quantum field in, in, in uh, creation and annihilation operators has to, to take this into account. So, so you have the, the, the expansion in like in the in equation 19. And of course, since this, this is a complex scalar field, you have to consider two different types of a of creation and annihilation operators. One for the particle, which I am considering here, which the a operators, and one for the antiparticle, which which are the b operators. So we can so a vacuum our vacuum state is going to basically depend on the, our definition of the modes, right? So we define the in vacuum state by being the state that is annihilated by these A and B operators that are associated to the in and up modes. And this vacuum state is going to be the one that has no particles in the past boundary of the space time. So at past no infinity and at the past horizon, you have no particle, so it's as empty as possible there. And 
And we can also do the same analogous thing for the up, out, and down modes and define a, a, a natural out vacuum state. And, and we are interested in whether these in and out vacuums are the same, right? So we can, uh, basically we know that they are not the same and because there is going to be a super radiant flux at infinity in the in vacuum state at the, in the future, right? So it can't be uh, equal to the out vacuum state since the out vacuum state is as empty as possible at the future, no infinity. So to show that we can look at some observables. So the first one would, would be the scalar field condensate, which, uh, which this uh, quantity here, but in this case, it's not a good candidate because uh, it, it's not time dependent. It doesn't have a time dependency. And so the time reverse. So since the in and out vacuum are, uh, are stationary at the, and one is the time reverse of the other, the expectation value of this scalar field condensate is going to be the same in both states. So we, before we consider the expectation value of the scalar field current and the stress energy tensor. And, and so here we, it's, so here is basically what the operational part of the, so we have these two operators, we want to compute the expectation values of that. So for that, we need to solve the, for the modes of the scalar field, we do this numerically, and then we integrate the contributions of these modes for the expectation values of these operators. The problem is that, as we know, these uh, these quantities are probably U ultraviolet has have divergence in the ultraviolet region. So first, we have to take we try to renormalize these quantities here uh, to get something that's uh, that is finite, right? But uh, fortunately for us, the J and the J are component of the, the current operator and the TRT components, uh, they, are, they don't require renormalization. And you can show that by, uh, you can show that by basically using a technique, since it's a free field in the background, curved space time, you can use Hadamard uh, point splitting technique using uh, Hadamard, the Hadamard structure. And, and then you can show that the subtraction terms you have are, are zero in the case of the JR and TRT component. Since the in vacuum state, it's, uh, it's, it's, well, it's not a Hadamard state, but it obeys the Hadamard singular, singular structure Except at the horizon, so you can subtract uh, the, this, the divergent quantities at least outside the horizon. And so this is basically the contributions of the modes here. So it's a, a bit ugly quantities, but I'm not going to go into details about that. The only thing I'm going to say is that you can solve, you have to solve for these X functions here numerically, and then you insert them in this mode contributions, and then you integrate them and to compute the expectation values in the, in the in or out vacuum state. So a good thing is that these expectation values obeys uh, conservation equations. So the J operator uh, the conservation equation for that basically show us uh, that the static states will have this form of the, like equation 30 and the stress energy tensor obeys a quote unquote conservation equation with, uh, with a source 
that is the, is the electromagnet background, the electromagnetic field in the right hand side. And so that the TRT component will, is going to have a, a, a simple form as well. So we compute that for uh, using a numerical integration. So I'm going to show the results here. And what we get is the figure two here. It's basically summarize the result that, as I said, since the the JR component, it's it obeys a conservation equation, uh, R R squared times the J the expectation value of JR should be a constant, and this is the red line, the red straight line here, that shows that we have a a flux of uh, near infinity, we have a flux of uh, particles uh, sup in the super region regime, and 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 uh, so that the, in, and it's said that the mechanism uh, basically try to tries to discharge the black hole. So it it the flux of particles is like is uh, has the same charge of the black hole, so that it. Uh, it's actually discharging and so it's lowering the charge of the black hole, the absolute value of the char of the charge of the black hole. So it tries to make it more uh, neutral, right? And and we also have the behavior of the stress energy tensor component, the TRT component, which shows that it which shows a, a that there is an energy flux. So it basically supports the the outgoing flux at infinity, and also if we compute the other components, uh, we can the form of this this uh, stress energy tensor supports the the quantum atmosphere point of view. So you have basically you have a atmosphere of of a, a quantum region uh, uh, outside the horizon that's basically it's the source of these fluxes at infinity so it's the same as it happens in the Hawking radiation case so figure three is just a, a, a plot of the JR component as we increase the value of the charge of the scalar field and then we get the expected behavior that the flux of JR is uh, flux of charge is large as, as we increase the charge, and and uh, and this of course is expected because this phenomenon, this process is basically dependent on the on the how strong is the interaction between the let background electromagnetic field and the scalar field so on the coupling of, of those so you have this behavior here and this uh, what the figure four is basically a, a plot of the trt component as we vary the charge of the black hole so we might think you might think as we were thinking that all the the curves uh, intersect the 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 horizontal line as at zero at same point and so that it basically defines a, a space time uh, point of interest interest but it's not really the case because it's actually this r zero actually varies. Uh, a, a bit with the charge so and this is supported by a, if we look at the if we look at the the similar Penrose process for this right so if we look at a charged particle it decays near the horizon and and one of the particles falls in, into the black hole and the other uh, goes to infinity with a larger charge than the re original one. 
And in this process, this pin rose process, you also get that this, this point, which would be the equivalent of the R0 is uh, depends weekly or weekly on the charge. So on the scale, on the charge of the particle. So, and so a little bit of conclusions and perspectives. So we studied the, the quantum, uh, the quantum superagent, uh, uh, super agents in, in this charge at black hole. And, and we, we have done this using full-fledged numerical, numerical computations and to compute the flux for all values of R. And, and we have shown that it's actually, there is a, uh, a, we have shown the profile of the, the fluxes by computing the, the, the expectation value of cer certain uh, operators of interest in this case. And so some perspectives, uh, just to finish, we can uh, try to look at this quantum superagents in other space times, in particular, for instance, in stars, which is not a, a something easy to do and it's not, I, I don't think it's, it's, uh, it has a lot of studies in this subject. We also may look at surrounding matters uh, scenarios so that there is a black hole and then you have a, a surrounding matter with charge uh, in this. Uh, uh, so how, how this modifies the super agent profile and if there is super agents and we might also ask if the, is the horizon needed for this? Because at this point, we may interpret the superagents, the charge superagents as a, as a swing, swinger like effect, right? So you basically, you have the electromagnetic field, which this, which is going to be the source of, of this vacuum polarization process, but when we study superagents, it seems the boundary conditions at the horizon are essential for the for the pro, for the effect. So it, it's not really clear, at least to me, how how this this uh, uh, really what is essential for this this process and and it also as just maybe maybe a teasing of what we are working right now is basically you can use that this this super agents process to understand and interpret several other vacuum states you have you might define in the rice and northstone uh, black hole space time and and so that's what we are doing right now we are trying to study new vacuum states and see how they behave and how they can be compared to other vacuum states, other non vacuum states in, in ice and water. So uh, that's it. I, and I thank you for the attention. Uh, hello, Rafael, for the interesting talk. Hi. Um, so, uh, any questions from anyone in the audience? Or oh, perhaps right. just, just a comment, uh, Rafael. Uh, at some point, I think you said uh, the similarities between Hawking radiation and this. Uh, uh, super radiance process. Maybe you should uh, just point out the difference between them. All right. Yes. I I forgot to say that the the in, this super radiance thing is not uh, thermal in, in nature, so you you can describe the temperature for that. Uh, but, but you you have a similar term uh, when comparing some, some operator. operator. But, but one thing that you can, 
if I if I can comment about that. If you look at the scalar condensate, it's based the observer that uh, the observable that can differentiate two uh, effects, right? So the scalar condensate is going to have a different profile in the Hawking radiation uh, uh, problem, and and you can use the scalar condensate to to do that. See, okay, so Rafael. Thank you. Rafael. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks for the answer. I also had a, a question uh, because so I'm not used to this kind of uh, reasoning because I don't work on these topics. But when you were showing the plots of the expectation value of the stress energy tensor, so it happens that this expectation value is uh, greater than one in in uh, near the the black hole and it's smaller than one when you go to infinity. So intuitively that would mean that for me i mean giving giving not giving a lot of thought but intuitively it would mean that you are losing energy from infinity and getting it into the black hole but apparently what's happening is the opposite so could you explain to me a little bit better the plots so that maybe i can understand what's being uh, plotted there and so on well one thing that i can say about that uh, it, it, this is going to depend on the on the on your convention right so but so whether well, which is negative and not but it's it's but also the switching of the the signs you have to be careful when you look at the horizon using the grt components because you actually you have to uh, uh to say something better about this, you have to look at the Grosko components of the stress energy tensor when you, you are looking near the horizon. So, so basically when you are interpreting the plot, you can only say something about what happens near infinity using the TRT components. So the the complete description of what happens at the horizon needs better operator there which basically it amounts to using Rusko components of the stress energy tensor operator okay so right. maybe uh, maybe i can rephrase the question by looking at the plot of the stress energy tensor the expectation value how can you know that you are uh, getting energy at infinity and losing it uh, or, or extracting energy from the black hole just from looking at the plot so you you can look at the plot uh, and see that Rafael, uh, why don't you show the plot i think it's yes yeah so the the this here is the the it's negative right so it's you, you, it's a flux of energy in, at infinity. But the, I, I don't think the sign is really important because you, it actually it will depend on your on, on your conventions, right? So what is, so in the end you have to look at the, the continuity equation to see what's, what is the, the correct, uh, uh, the sign of the, of the stress energy test. So in our case, with the convention we are using, when uh, when you have a negative value of this flux of energy at infinity, you are losing energy. So uh, there is energy that is going outside the black the space time. Okay, so maybe you're saying that if you look at the uh, covariant at the divergence of the expectation value of the, the stress energy tensor, then this will tell you if you have a flux of energy going to infinity or maybe a flux of energy going to the black hole, right? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let's thank, uh, let's thank Rafael again for this amazing talk.